I'm long, as in this is going to be a long presentation. Okay, guys, so uh, this is the week where we're doing community impact, and that's sort of why I'm kind of dressed this way, except for the wig. I am imitating a millennial snowflake with a beanie, and of course the ah, wig. Okay, we got to talk about some cycles here in nature, okay? And with that, we're going to look at the carbon cycle here. So carbon, you know, is found in both living and non-living things, okay? You know that life on Earth is based on carbon. The cycle has to happen from the non-living, the abiotic, into the living things, okay? And with that, those same atoms of carbons, they get to use over and over and over again. So literally, they're cycling between the Earth and the atmosphere. Now, when we look at carbon reservoirs, there's a number of them. We've talked about the ocean being a place where carbon can be stored, but the atmosphere is also storing the carbon, notably in CO2, okay? Now, when we look in the ground, the lithosphere, we can look at limestone and dolomite, okay? Limestone's more common, and then things like our fossil fuels, like coal, oil, gas, okay? And we've talked about the reservoirs here, the atmosphere, the biosphere, the oceans, and the lithosphere. You know, what do we mean by reservoirs? Think of it when we talk about a reservoir of water, okay? It's a storage place where the carbon is going to be. And it makes sense about the air and the earth and the oceans, but in the rocks, it's in the sediments and the fossil fuels, okay? Now, there's different ways that the carbon gets released into the atmosphere. Uh, respiration by plants and animals, breathing out in particular in the form of carbon dioxide, the decay of plant and animal matter, combustion of organic material, so think fire, okay? Production of cement is another way. Uh, the ocean also releases CO2 into the atmosphere. We also have volcanic eruptions and metamorphism. Well, what do we mean by metamorphism? Well, we're looking at the changes that are happening in rocks. And that is a part of geology, and we'll talk about that later on, okay? Now, of course, carbon can be removed from the atmosphere in some different ways. Photosynthesis is an obvious one. Don't think just plants, think phytoplankton, okay? Uh, the oceans, here's the thing. When the seawater temperature goes down, you get more carbon dioxide dissolving, and it becomes carbonic acid. So there's some chemistry right there for you. Okay, in the upper ocean areas, the organisms convert reduced carbons to tissues or carbonates. Okay, so of course, well, how are we impacting the carbon uh, cycle? Burning fossil fuels, okay, it does have an impact on it. Okay, things like petroleum, natural gas, and coal. We look at how is that combustion happening here? So here's methane plus an unlimited supply of oxygen. Again, it is our excess reactant. And we got CO2, H2O, and energy. Now our goal is energy, which is also true for living things, to have energy. But in the process, we release CO2 into the atmosphere, okay? So if you're looking at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, Hawaii, okay, the CO2 has been going up uh, steadily. But this is also looking at parts per million, and we're going to talk about that kind of concentration unit uh, later on in the course. Nitrogen cycle. You know, everything needs nitrogen in order to make DNA, amino acids, which are your building blocks of proteins uh, as well. Okay, so we know it's in all living things. We can talk about amino acid structures. We can look at our pyrimidines and purines. Oh, wait, DNA, A, C, T, G. Okay, now nitrogen fixation happens in three ways, by bacteria, by lightning, and artificially. Artificially, think fertilizer, okay? So with that, Here's an overall view of the nitrogen cycle. So what we're looking at, we're looking at ammonium, nitrites, and nitrates as part of what's going on under the ground uh, for the nitrogen cycle, okay? So we have N2 in the atmosphere, okay? 
and what happens is it gets gets into the ground okay you've got nitrogen fixation it causes uh, the nitrogen when we say fixation it kind of takes it and it puts it together in a different way that's what we talk about fixation okay so we can go from N2 work our way through to make ammonium NH4 plus we're also getting it from dead things as well we got nitrifying bacteria we got nitrates as well okay because that's what the nitrifying bacteria does it creates nitrates and that gets picked up by the plants as well okay that's a fairly important thing okay so when we look at the steps of the nitrogen cycle the fixation and nitrification so in fixation it's really the first step you're making ammonia and ammonium Pay attention to the difference, okay? Ammonium has that extra hydrogen in there, has that plus one charge. So what is doing this fixation thing? Legumes, uh, things like peas, peanuts, okay, beans, those are your typical legumes that will do that. How do they do that? Well, they're root nodules, okay, with nitrogen fixing bacteria in the nodules. And this is what allows uh, this stuff to happen. Okay, nitrification makes nitrite and nitrate ions which can be used by producers or plants. Okay, now in this case here, these are nitrates, NO3, nitrite is NO2, okay, NO2, that will be a nitrite, because nitrate you have one more oxygen. That's the difference between the eights and the ites. Okay. Moving on. Okay, I guess I'll have to do it the old-fashioned way then. So the idea is this, that the plant roots, so the bacteria, they make those nitrates and the nitrites, and what happens is the plant roots, they end up taking it up, and then they bring that into the plant itself. Okay, now something's a little screwy there. Okay. So how do humans affect the nitrogen cycle? It's just, us, it's just us adding the nitrogen in there. Now, why in the world do we add nitrogen into the soil? Because we want to produce more crops and thus more food. That's the thing, okay? Now, of course, waste products and dead bodies of organisms also have an impact as well, putting nitrogen back into the soil. Uh, that's why I use the banyos here to represent the waste products. And, well, yeah, we got a dead thing here. All right, let's move on. So again, uh, do you have denitrifying bacteria that are going to put the nitrogen back into the air in the form of natural nitrogen gas? And that's where the cycle ends. And when we started out as N2 in the atmosphere, it gets absorbed into the soil, and then you end up being changed into ammonia, ammonium. Then, of course, it ends up being picked up Okay, it becomes uh, part of the plant material, and then once that happens, you got the denitrifying bacteria that will put it back into the air. Okay, let's look at the phosphorus cycle. I kind of got to speed things up a little bit here. So phosphorus, uh, yeah, everybody needs it. Okay, and it's found in all the living things. Think. ATP, AP bioheads, you know this one, adenosine triphosphate, then you have adenosine diphosphate, ATP, and then of course cyclical, AMP, cyclical adenosine monophosphate. I don't know if Long has covered that part yet, but that's what you've got going for it. Okay, and also, you know, you have got phosphate groups here within the DNA, not to mention in our bones. So with this, um, phosphates, the phosphorus, you're not finding it in the air. Uh, you are finding it in geological uplifting. You're finding it in the rocks and the sediments. And what happens is the rain will go and weather the phosphate from the rocks. And now it can go into the ocean here to form new rocks, but it can also go into the soil where plants will absorb it, the animals will also take it in because the animals eat the plants. And then there's the decomposers, and then you got the phosphate going into the soil. 
which then it goes in what by leaching it goes into the water through the through the hydrologic cycle and then you end up getting it all over again and how is the phosphate coming out how's the phosphorus coming out it's that geological uplifting what do we mean by that think about earthquakes think about how mountains are being lifted up uh, that's what's happening and you have a weathering of the rocks in the mountains and they work their way down into the stream by the process of weathering okay you have rain that's going to also help in this process okay now it can also so we said about erosion of rocks from the mountains okay but it's also can be recycled from animal feces and urine and from decomposition uh, bat guano is a classic very high in phosphorus. There are people who actually make a living shoveling bat guano. Okay, now the phosphate eventually goes to the ocean as chemicals and then that becomes phosphate sediments. So once the phosphates are in there, they settle in. And then what happens is over time, this gets lifted up. And then that's where you're gonna find the phosphate in the sedimentary layers. Okay, keep in mind, there is no gas phase in the phosphorus cycle, okay? Now, in the water, you have phosphate ions that are combined with other elements. So you can have PO4, HPO4, and H2PO4. So we can have those running around. And yes, they can go and connect with other things. Keep in mind, with those uh, numbers there, in this case, though, there are the anions. That means they can hook up with something else, which is totally natural. This is all on autopilot, okay? So plants and other living things, they need lots of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, but there's also stuff called macro elements, secondary elements, and micro elements. Macro is where we need those in a lot, a large amount. And I gotta look at my timing here. I'm doing great. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, so NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those are your three main ones. Secondary, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And then the micro elements would include things like iron, boron, zinc, copper, manganese, and molybdenum. Wow, that's a fun one. All right, sulfur cycle, we gotta wrap up. So of course, sulfur is part of things like vitamins, hormones, which is a kind of protein uh, as well. It's a signaler, if you will. Uh, but proteins. You also have amino acids that do have sulfur in there like cysteine and methionine as well. Okay, uh, that is part of our diet. Sulfur is that nice yellow stuff on there. It goes through the biosphere. Okay, so we can find it in organisms, ocean sediments, soil, rocks, and fossil fuels. Okay, so SO2 sources, for example, are volcanoes, H2S, dihydrogen sulfide sources, volcanoes. This is what gives the rotten eggs their smell. And H2SO4 and SO4 minus, um, they are forms of the sulfur in there. I'm not gonna worry about the source there. How do we affect the uh, sulfur cycle? Uh, burning sulfur containing coal and oil Okay, refine sulfur containing petroleum and convert sulfur containing metallic mineral ores. So what we've done, we've had to actually put more sulfur into the system because of some of the stuff that we have been doing as a civilization. But I'm gonna point something out. For what we're doing here, when volcanoes erupt, they put out a lot more sulfur than we do over a number of years. What humans do in a number of years, you can have that in one volcano eruption. All right, so this is what we have for our uh, sulfur cycle here in the form of sulfur dioxide in the air. You get sulfuric acid and sulfate deposited as acid rain. So that is a problem. Uh, we will talk about acid rain. Uh, later on. There is also acid fog. We do have that here in the San Bernardino Mountains. Okay, but it ends up working its way down into the soil and then of course it gets taken up. It gets taken up by mining, extraction, because we do use sulfur for a lot of things. It can also work its way into the ocean sediments 
as well, okay? And I'm going to have to wrap this bad boy up, okay? This is the end of chapter three. I'm long, and you're not.